So I want to tell you a little bit, just a couple, uh, maybe half a minute about myself and how I ended up coming here and speaking with you folks. So I used to do animal control for 14 years in Arlington, Virginia. And in the beginning, you know, trapped girl cats, brought them in, euthanized. Clearly that wasn't working. So the county decided to adopt a TNR program in 2009. As chief of animal control, I was totally against it. I thought TNR was stupid, didn't work. Why are we wasting our money? So they said, well, just sit in your office and don't worry about it. So I did, and so did my deputies. <laughs> so we pouted it for a while, and life went on. About six months later, I started seeing this improvement. The folks were happier out in the neighborhoods. We weren't getting the complaints like we were. So I went to our uh, chief operating officer and I said, listen, you know, I'm not saying I was wrong or anything, <laughs> but I'll bet if you let the ACOs take over the program, we could do a much better job than you're doing. She wasn't insulted. She was actually very happy. So we took over the program. Next thing you know, the animal control department was loved by the community. We built this relationship the caretakers, the caregivers were calling us, asking for help. I still get, I left there in October of last year. I still get text messages from caregivers wishing me a Merry Christmas, wishing me a happy birthday. Sometimes they'll say, hey, can you come and uh, help me spay a cat? So I then can turn them to animal control. And, uh, but I work for Alley Cat Allies and I work with animal control agencies now and the shelters and explain how this can, uh, how your organization can benefit from TNR. It makes a difference when it's coming from me because I did it for so long and I was kind of uh, uneducated for a long time. So, so Scott is going to follow me and this guy is like my hero. So um, I'm glad I'm not following him. So we're going to go ahead and start, okay? And some of these slides we're going to blow through because we're kind of short on time, and if you could hold your questions to the end, that would be great. So thank you, American Pets Alive. So what we're going to try to do is today is we're going to explain why the cats are okay outside. They're not suffering. They're not in danger. I mean, this slide shows cats have been around for at least 9,500 years. Cat litter was not even invented until 1946, right? <laughs> And you get that, this is my favorite slide, because once you say it like that, people are like, oh. <laughs> and these are things that you can help the public also. Tell them these things, explain this to them. So who are the community cats? They live outdoors, they avoid humans. You know, these are the things that they're called. Sometimes they're friendly, sometimes they're not. Basically, they are, they're owned by the community, right? Everybody knows these cats. Sometimes they have four or five feeders. Sometimes they only have one. But the most important thing is they're being taken care of. And they're out in the community where they belong. They're happy. The shelters, they're not designed for feral cats. Feral cats, almost always 100% euthanasia rate, right? Unless you've got a great barn program. 70% of all cats that enter the animal shelters are euthanized. And it's time we turn that all around. So the vacuum effect. My whole thing that I didn't understand is, well, if there's five cats in the yard, we go and remove five cats. They don't go back. It's simple math, but it's not. It's a whole ecosystem. Keep those cats where they belong so that more don't take over that territory. And at least you've got five cats instead of 15 raccoons. It's much better to keep them out of there. Or keep them in there and keep the other animals out of there. Trap, neuter, return. You're trapping them humanely. You're spaying and neutering, vaccinating and ear tipping. They're going right back where they came from and they're happy. They know that home. And they, don't, they have no idea what happened to them the day before when they had surgery. 
So this, you can see, in 2003, there were 23 localities with ordinances regarding TNR. Now there's at least 600. Those are just the ones that we know of. Every day we hear more and more folks, they have these ordinances. I mean, today I've met two people, you know, just in the last hour that have ordinances. And I'm like, follow up with us. Let us know what's going on. Tell us how it's going. The main reasons for TNR. Obviously, it reduces the cat population, improves the life of the cat. We all know that the behavior is modified. They're not fighting. They're not looking for food. They're much happier. The neighbors, the human neighbors, are so much happier because, again, they're not fighting. They're not running all over the place. And they're not tearing up furniture and whatnot. And it helps the shelter. It helps the shelter. It brings the euthanasia rate down. And what happens when that comes down? The community, they embrace the shelter. The staff is so much happier. And obviously the cats are happier. And the other cats are healthier in the shelter, the adoptable, because a, a shelter with less population is a healthier shelter. So the SNR. So a lot of shelters are turning to SNR when they get not just the feral cats in, any cats. Where did this cat come from? Let's go ahead and return it. Let's go ahead and spay it. Let's neuter it. Vaccinate it. The vet's going to look it over. We're going to put it back. We're going to make sure it's healthy. Some of these cats have never even seen a vet. That's an amazing thing to be able to put them in front of a vet. So I kind of rushed because I thought we were a little bit shorter on time. But that'll give you guys uh, more time for a Q&A. So this is a really important subject for me because a few years ago in Arlington County, we stopped taking in stray cats. When we stopped taking in stray cats, people were not happy with us. You know, you have to remember that when they're coming to you, when these folks are coming to you, you are the animal experts. How many folks work in shelters here? Okay, great. So you are the animal experts in the community. They're looking to you for advice. This is your opportunity to educate them. They come in with a stray cat. These are the questions. First off, is it sick or injured? If it's sick or injured, it's a whole different ball game. You have to decide what kind of medical attention it needs. If it's not, it's a healthy stray. There's no reason for it to be there, right? Does it have ID? If it has an ear tip, that doesn't always mean it's feral. A lot of places are doing ear tips now, right? That's part of their program. They'll put it through the TNR program, but they just have to, they have to tip it. Have you spoken to your neighbors? Are they missing a cat? A lot of these folks are not talking to neighbors. How long has the cat been in the area? If they say a week or an hour, your response should always be the same. Let's try to find the owner, but the best thing to do is put it back so the owner can find the cat. But these are some things that we can help you with. Let's file a found report. Let's make the found posters. There's plenty of templates out there. Alley Cat Allies has a template on their website you can use. I think Best Friends has one. Get the found posters up and tell them, talk to the mail carriers and the delivery folks, and then call the vets. And if they're at home, that's even better. If they're calling, if they didn't show up with the cat, you know, tell them to take it by the vet, have the vet scan it, or even bring it to the shelter and let you scan it. I think the main thing to remember throughout all this, when folks are bringing in these strays, 
is that these, these people have taken the time to pick this animal up and try to help it. So just remember that. And remember that they are, again, coming to you as an expert, and they're looking for your help. They're looking for your advice. So it's really important that you work as a team and thank them for helping this animal. But again, you want the animal to go back, right? So that's how you work with them. Tell them to talk to the neighbors. Make sure the neighbors, if there's a listserv, an email listserv, make sure they get on that. More than likely, that cat has got five people feeding it, especially if it's a plump cat. But again, it should be healthy. Ask if they can keep an eye on the cat. You know, do you want to hold it for a while? Do all these things and see if you can find the owner. And again, you're part of a team. You're helping them. They've come to you for advice. See if they want a litter pan. See if they want food. Make it as easy as possible for them to keep that cat with them. When you're talking to these folks, they can be stubborn, right? It is the public, after all. So you want to be transparent. And these are some final words that you can use to talk to these folks. And again, they're trying to help the animal. You know, they could have left the animal. Um, you know, they could have picked it up, dropped it off somewhere. They've brought it to the experts. They've brought it to a shelter. Be honest. You know, only 3% of the cats in shelters go home. And as much as we're trying to improve that, it still stays there. It is absolutely staying there. Um, I pulled some numbers. So, so I was at Animal Trosser in Arlington, Virginia. And I pulled the Virginia numbers. And uh, Virginia is pretty uh, strict about all the reporting numbers. So in the last, it was last five, last six years, the return rate to owners has only improved by 1%. It was actually like half a percent. So it shows we're not, we're not able to do a very good job about returning them, but I think that we also, we shouldn't beat ourselves up too much because we're trying our best to return those guys to their homes, these strays, but it, we need to get the citizens more involved, the owners, make sure that they know that they're to look at the shelter for their lost cat. And in those six years, I would say probably the majority of the shelters in Virginia have stopped taking in strays. So my, my point is, the return rate has barely changed, but without taking the strays in, the euthanasia rate in the last six years has improved by 50% for the state. So it's showing that we're not euthanizing as many. But it's still, again, the strays that come in, we just can't get them back home to their owners. Does that all make sense? OK. So here's some things to talk to the citizen when they come in. You know, the cat looks healthy. It's being taken care of. You know, we should not be intervening. Again, go back to the, the found report. The owners are probably looking for it. You know, we have to take into consideration, and these are all things to talk, to let them know these things. You know, what if they're elderly folks that the cat went out and they just don't have the resources? You know, the elderly folks may not have internet. I mean, look, I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm 48 years old, I barely know how to use the internet. So, you know, it, it, there are some barriers. It could be a language barrier depending on where you live. They don't know where to look. And then maybe we as shelters can use these, this opportunity to offer some more resources. Finally, you know, let's give this guy a week or so to find a home. If you don't find the owner in a week, give us a call back. 
as Almatross, or we used to get these calls in the evenings all the time, we monitor, monitor the phone 24 hours a day. And I would say the majority, and I'm talking 99%, they never called back. They either found the owner or just decided they liked the cat. Make sure you tell them how much you appreciate what they did. They're taking care of these guys out there. They're, they cared enough to bring, either call or bring the cat in. If they decide to take it back, I want you to treat them as well as you would an adopter. They started out that day just to drop a cat off at the shelter. And what they've done is now decide to embrace this cat either by taking it home and holding it or taking it back where it belongs. That was something they, they, they hadn't planned on doing that day. When your adopter comes in, they already know they're, they're taking an animal home. So make sure you treat them respectfully. And it doesn't hurt to say, you know what? I think this cat likes you. <laughs> I think you should name the cat. I think you should give it, because we know what happens after that. But again, these are the things, and, and this isn't, this isn't something that I haven't done or you haven't done while trying to talk to the folks. It's not an easy job. As a matter of fact, I always tell people, the hardest part about a TNR program is talking to the public, convincing them that it is the best thing to do. So these are some deterrents, because we know a lot of times they come into the shelter whether it's feral or non-feral, or just community cat in general, because they're going onto the property. So, and Scott, I want you to make sure, if you would, tell the story about the cat that you picked up and uh, the owner came out. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I love this story. I've heard it a million times, and it gets better each time. He always adds to it, so it's really good. <laughs> so, yeah, so these are some deterrents. You know, the trash cans, normally when the cats are getting in the trash cans, quote unquote cats, it's usually the raccoons. Yep. All right. Bungee those up. In Arlington, we had the big plastic trash cans that you got from the county. Drill two holes, wrap it around the handle, go into the hole. And listen, if you can get a bunch of bungee cords from Home Depot, send some of your staff out there and some of the volunteers, make that a day, make that a community day, meet the community. By doing this, even if they hate the cats, they love when you come out and just make eye contact, put a face to the voice. They love that you're out there helping them. The shake away, I've heard a lot of good things. The scarecrow, that is the one that sprays the water that works for deer, foxes, any animal, even squirrels. Although the squirrels can be, uh, they can be pretty stubborn. I've seen some of them just stand in the middle of it and get drenched. So the cat stop, it sends off like this sonar noise that only the cats can hear. And you won't have any stray dogs around either. They'll keep those guys around. We actually had these. The cat stop and scarecrows we would keep at the Arlington shelter, and we would loan those out to people, and they would use them. The cat stop, we had a lady who, she had some feral cats. She was a little difficult. She was a lot difficult to deal with. Um, we TNR'd all her cats and would call us and say, I need five cans of food. And you said, well, you know, I'll bring some food out tomorrow. And she called back and said, that was the wrong kind. Her and her neighbor, they lived in a duplex. There was a lot of duplexes in Arlington. And uh, they would fight a lot. And uh, I'm sorry, did I, did I do that? There we go. So they would fight a lot. And we really felt bad for the neighbor. He lived next door. So we ordered some of these cat stops, and we said, listen, we haven't used these yet. Go ahead and try it. So he put it on the porch, and uh, it worked. Well, we get a call the next day or a couple days later that he had put 
this uh, device out that emitted nuclear radiation. <laughs> and she could tell because the cat's eyes were a lot funnier. So we wanted to say we were going to call like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, but we just finally explained to her, it's OK. So down the bottom left, Citrus. I've got a one-year-old cat. He was 15 ounces when I brought him home. His name's Captain Bobby. He got up on the counter, knocked a clementine down on the floor, and uh, went and sniffed it and took off. Has never touched another one again. So I can tell you, Citrus works. We can't even use any kind of lotion it's like orange or lemon scented. Um, vinegar, coffee grounds. Coffee ground keeps them out. Not only does it keep it out, but people say their plants are growing better. So it's a win-win. These little prongy things, they're, they're fantastic. And you don't have to keep these in forever. You really don't. It keeps the raccoons out, too, because they like to, uh, like to eat the grubs. All of these things, we've got a link on Alley Cat Allies. And they're not free, but if the cat stop, Scarecrow, all of this stuff you can get at a discount. We've got links that goes to the manufacturers. So I wanted to, uh, do I still have enough? Am I doing okay on time? Okay, great. So I wanted to go back and talk to you about um, some more benefits of TNR since we have a little bit more time. Um, when Animal Control started working with the community, what we found was we came up with with Alley Cat Allies' help, some best practices for feeding and housing of feral cats and community cats. And we would talk to the residents, the caregivers, and say, you know, we want to help you. We want to get this going. We'd like you to feed 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes at night. Their first response is, well, they're going to starve to death. So no, they're not. They're going to be on a schedule. Just like you feed me at a certain time of day, I'm going to be there every day. And I'll be back in the evening. What happened was the rodent problem, if there was a rodent problem, dissipated. The raccoons didn't come around, the foxes, any other animals such as that. Also with shelters, we said, take your shelters if you have shelters, and put them in the back. Put them where the folks can't see them and the feeding stations. Make sure they're, you, what you're trying to do is you're trying to protect the cats, and you want them to be hidden from the public. So they did that. And we also made them agree. We didn't do registration, but we kept a list of everybody, and we would go back every other month with donated cat food, and that was a gift, like a host or hostess gift when you go to somebody's house. It's just, you know, it's just polite. And they loved us doing that. And then what we were able to do is we were able to look around, make sure everybody was doing what they were supposed to do. And then they would call us if, they, if an untipped cat came in or if they needed help, anything like that. It, it built the strength, this bond that was so strong with the Animal Control Department and the community that I think that of all the things we ever did in animal control, I mean, we're talking vet assistants, low-call spay-neuter, and just going out and running service calls, TNR is the key to a happy community. So I'm going to bring uh, ask Scott to come up and uh, come on up here. Thank you, Scott. Okay, so the story that Alice was referring to, um, we had been working the, the, our TNR program at uh, the Humane Rescue Alliance, and uh, our officers were also doing the TNR. And we went out to this neighborhood. We got a call about a cat, and we went out to this neighborhood, and we saw the cat in the alleyway, and it was obvious he owned this alley. He was a big tomboy. He just you know, sat there and you know, 
we saw some food cans and some dishes in a, in a yard. And for some reason, the only name I remember is Freddy, but I'm not sure if it was the cat or the, or the caregiver. Um, so anyway, so the officer picks up the cat, and the guy comes out, and he says, my God, what are you doing with Freddy? What are you doing with Freddy? He's, you know, he's, he's okay. Nothing, you know, he doesn't cause any problems. The officer explained TNR to him, said, we're going you know, to fix him up, give him a shot, ear tip. You know, you'll see that, and we'll bring him back tomorrow. Well, the next day when he came back, a woman from uh, across the alleyway. DC has a lot of pub, uh, a lot of alleys separating homes. Um, so when he pulls into the alley to release Freddie, woman comes out calling the cat a completely different name, saying, "Oh my God, I saw you pick him up. I thought he was gone forever." Uh, but, you know, and and she was worried about the cat. And you know, Pete said, "No, no, we're you know we're going to release him. Everything's fine." He says, "Do you know the guy over here? And do you do you talk? Oh no, we don't talk all that much." And you know, so Pete introduced them. And they all started talking, and they got on a feeding schedule, as Alice you know, mentioned. Um, the, the cat was obviously upset with us because he used to get two breakfasts, two dinners, and now he was only getting one of each. Um, they, had, you know, they, had talked to, they ended up talking to other neighbors and, and just embracing the, the, the community in the community cat theory. So, um, yeah, that's what it's all about. I mean, back in the day, when I first started doing TNR back in the... the um, mid to early 90s, um, the, the whole thing was keeping them hidden. Don't let anyone know they're there. Don't let, don't let anyone see you feed them. Don't let anyone know you're doing this. Keep them in the woods. Keep them, you know, keep them out of the public eye. Um, and now it's like they're embraced. They're, it's a, it, and that's why we refer to them now as community cats rather than feral cats. We don't use the term feral cats, free roaming cats. If it's outside, it's a community cat. It might be owned by someone in the community, might be lost, but Nevertheless, it's a community cat. So, um, where to begin? What we, you know, we're we're really big on the whole community involvement. Um, we don't think that we are uh, above the community. Uh, we are um, we are a public servant to the community. We are part of the community, and we work with the community. So. Um, you know, the, the important thing for, for us was doing community outreach, getting the word out, checking the laws and, uh, and regulations, dealing with the objections that might come, calming some fears, dealing with the conflict resolutions, building partnerships to, to save lives. Um, and I'm going to go a little quick over my conflict resolution because I think that uh, Alice did a great job and we do all the same thing. Uh, so. For those of you who haven't, haven't heard me speak at all today, um, the, the Humane Rescue Alliance is a 24-hour facility in DC. Uh, we operate the city's animal control unit, and we, again, we are 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if there's a call regarding a cat um, that is not sick or injured, um, the dispatchers will deal with that call themselves. And so what we did was we, we did a lot of training for our dispatchers on talking to the public Regarding, uh, regarding TNR, the Alley Cat Allies has the National Help Desk, and seeing how they're so close to us, we kind of pick their brains, and I actually just hired the former manager of the National Help Desk um, to run this program for me. But you know, it used to be where someone would call up, and we would just go right out, pick up the cat, bring them back, and euthanize them. Uh, and those days are gone. So now, when someone calls up with a concern over a cat, our call takers um, tell people, yeah, TNR is the only thing we do. We don't just come and remove animals. We don't just come remove healthy cats, unless they're sick or injured. Sorry, I put NSOI. I don't know if everyone knows what that stands for in animal control speak. It's uh, non-sick or injured, or SOI would be sick or injured. Um, so you know, now when people say, I want these damn cats out of my yard, which is some, you know, it happens, um, we tell them that the only, only service the district provides is TNR. We do not remove. Um, we've created door hangers. Uh, we put door hangers up on, on doors when we're doing a trapping in an area. We will hang do uh, the door hangers and the flyers in the area, showing people, you know, telling people what we're doing in case you have a cat that you're allowing outdoors, uh, for one. And for two, if you are feeding these cats, give us a call. Let us know. We're, we're, you know, we're going we're gonna to work as a, as a community to, to make sure that um, everyone's working together and no one's duplicating efforts and, and everyone knows everyone. Um, we do a lot of social media on community cats. Uh, we don't hide it anymore. And we've actually got earned media um, where we've gotten stories in the Washington Post 
Uh, we've gotten a lot of the local papers um, talking about TNR and the benefits. Although lately it's been mostly just the controversy, the bird people versus the cat people and that horrendous book that came out that I'm afraid to even mention. Um, we are constantly going to neighborhood association meetings to talk about cats, um, tabling at events. We do loan out traps, but on a very supervised and very specific way of dealing with it. Like, um, we don't, if someone can't just call up and say, yeah, I got some cats in my yard, can you loan us some traps? We don't do that. Um, they'll talk to either an officer or someone on the community cats team uh, and make sure that they're, they, they know it's only t for TNR, What's what's your plan? Who you know? What's going on? Okay, we'll bring you over the trap. If you can bring the cat in when you trap them, great. Otherwise, we'll come and get him if you can't. So let us know. And then again, the deterrence and so forth. <coughs> so this is um, this is the door hanger. The the hole is up under there. Incidentally, we for those of you who don't know, we were the Washington Humane Society up until um, two weeks ago. Uh, we are now the Humane Rescue Alliance. Uh, we had a merger, and uh, we did a whole rebranding and, and, and so forth. So a lot of my material says Washington Humane Society, whereas it's actually the Humane Rescue Alliance. Anyway, so here, are, here is the, um, the door hangers that we hang. On the other side, this is for animal control. On the other side of this, it says a stray, stray animal, and you could fill in a circle, cat or dog, has been found in your neighborhood. If you are the owner or know the owner, please contact us. And so w w when the officers or when the catnip staff goes out, they're just putting them up, putting them up, putting them up everywhere. Um, we actually got bus ads in certain parts of the city. We, we had a targeted effort on, in Southeast DC. Um, we got a grant from PetSmart Charities and we have these big, on the whole side of a bus is this. See cats, feed cars, cats, call us. Um, it was really cool seeing one of the buses go by with the ad on it. And again, the cat stop unit um, that, that Alice mentioned is something that we, we, we also have a large quantity of. The, the cat stops and the scarecrows, we have a large quantity and we loan them out as well. And what we do is we tell people, if you want to keep it, give us 50 bucks um, and we'll buy a new one with that or you can just go on Amazon and buy a new one. They're only like 50, 60 bucks at most. So the laws, this was the law in DC in 1929 that was passed in 1929, basically saying that animal control or the pound master back then shall round up and kill all the loose cats. And any citizen may do the same and round them up and bring them in to be euthanized. Um, obviously that didn't work. And in 2010, we got city council to agree to add a um, at a TNR provision to the district law, which enables us, if you look back here, um, we say DC law promotes trap new and return. The only thing we do when, when someone calls us to remove, we say we only TNR because that's what district law tells us we can do. So that's why we have that. That's how we use that law. Um, it doesn't matter if it's, it doesn't, it doesn't mandate us, which kind of wish it did, but uh, we've had the animal control contract since 1980, and it's not going anywhere, especially now that we emerged. We're the only organization in the city, so no one else can come in and put a bid in for the contract. So it's almost like a sole source contract at this point. Uh, we just win-win. <laughs> Some of the concerns we had um, for both staff as well as members of the public city council uh, and, and, and Alice pointed a lot of this out too, is how do we tell the difference between a lost cat and a cat that qualifies for TNR? Incidentally, there is a law in DC, um, the running at large law is, it doesn't specify cat or dog. So you, if you own a cat, it is illegal to let your cat roam loose to go outside. Um, you can get a fine for that, we can pick the cat up and impound them and no different than a dog. So that's where a lot of the concern came from us, and it's the same holding period. Five days if, we, if, it was, if there's no identification, seven days if there is identification. Um, so you know, a, lot of, a lot of the staff and, and members of the public and the, uh, and the city council were concerned. How do you know the difference? Now, how many of you have ever worked in the, in the street with feral or, or community cats? Okay, you know. Right, you don't need you know you you don't need a guide to tell you this cat lives in this neighborhood and is owned and 
you know, is, 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 is owned by the neighbors and everyone's caring for them, they have this air of confidence about them. When they, when they walk through their alleyways or through those yards, they're not running from bush to bush hiding. They're not crying to get into buildings. They're, you can tell, and, and especially a, a, an, a, an experienced field person, and I'm gonna keep going back to officers because that's what I refer to them. Um, you know, my, my, the officers, that's what we use the most. An experienced officer knows the difference between a lost pet, an abandoned pet, and a community cat that's being cared for that owns that, that, that alleyway or that yard or that neighborhood. Um, there's just a way about them. But we have to, you know, we have to provide something. So we put this together. This is actually in our community cat SOP uh, that says, you know, these, these situations will automatically disqualify it initially from being a community cat candidate and will be brought to the shelter for stray hold. During the stray hold, the animal control officer or, or the, well, the staff will do some investigation. We'll look into it to see if this, at the end of the stray hold, um, can, should he, can or should he be TNR'd? You know, if he's really friendly and, you know, if everything's just adoptable about this cat, yeah, we may place him up for adoption if there's no other indication that he was a cared for community cat. Um, but there are times when we'll hold them for five days and say, you know what, let's put him back. Let's put him back where we found him. And we do it often. But these are, you know, this is what we use as a guide. Uh, and it seems to, it seems to work. It seems to work. Um, we are required, unlike uh, Alice in Arlington, we are required to take in stray cats. We can't turn any animal away. Uh, that's not only by our own internal policy, but by law. Uh, the contract states we have to take in animals 24 hours a day, seven days a week, can never say no. Uh, Alice went through a little bit of this too as, as well, you know, the monitoring the cats, what we, what we recommend for best practices, so to speak. Um, you know, we, 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 we say that, you know, feed, feeding for half an hour, only enough to feed those particular cats. And I've heard the same thing from people. They're going to starve to death. And I've had to go back during off hours to find food that was left behind. And, you know, they, they don't trust you right away. But really, if you, um, if you put food down for half hour, 45 minutes, just enough for the cats that you have and you take them away, you take it away when, after that time period, those cats will learn right quick when you're putting the food down, how much is gonna be there, and when, you know, when to be there. And they do, and it does. It keeps wildlife and rodent complaints down. Uh, you'd be amazed, and, and, and I'll just echo again what Alice said, this drives the complaints down considerably. That is actually a good thing that we used when we went to city council to talk about in, enacting this ordinance, because DC does have a large rodent population. Um, there, there, there are a lot of concerns, uh, and the neighborhoods that have community cats don't complain about it as much. So we're able to use that uh, in, in our efforts to further TNR. Uh, it also uh, enables you to know if a new cat arrives. If you have a managed colony, so to speak, and a new cat starts showing up, who is this cat? You know, is this now a lost pet? And if, if, if a cat gets out, gets lost, finds, you know, finds his way into a colony with his food and safety, he's not gonna, he might not go back looking for his home. So what we recommend is because of our policies and because of the way we do it, um, if the animal's tame and so forth, bring them in for a stray hold. We'll look for lost reports. We will, you know, we'll, we'll do what we can. And then we'll TNR him at the end of the day if you're willing to add him to the, to the mix and he's, unado you know, he's unadoptable, you want to add him back in, we'll do that. We'll do everything for free. Um, it also allows you to keep watch on their overall health and know if someone is missing. How many of you, how many of you care for feral cats yourself? How many of you have a colony? Okay, just, just a couple. Um, before I started doing this, I, I've had several colonies and you'd be amazed at how many black cats you really do have. Um, you know, I thought, there were times when I thought I only had one or two black cats and I found out I had like four or five. Because once I got them on a schedule and they all showed up, I'm like, whoa, where'd you come from? And you never know. Um, but this, this gives you the opportunity or gives the caregiver the opportunity to keep a closer eye and closer monitoring of the cat's overall health and well-being. 
And if someone's missing, call us. File a loss report because maybe maybe one of your cats wandered down the street and became became sick or you know became injured, sick or injured, or got picked up by someone a caring citizen and brought them in. And um, you know we also provide shelters and feeding um, feeding stations. And again, back again, we we do work with those caregivers. The feeding stations are really cool. We have um, several different types. These are just Rubbermaid bins. We host workshops, and you'd be amazed at how many just members of the public come in. So we advertise it as though if you have cats and you want a shelter, here's the supplies. Do us a favor, buy two of everything, come in. We'll do a workshop. We'll all make them. We'll make two. You take one back, keep one for a colony that doesn't have someone who cares as much as you do. And these are like these are the extras from the last workshop that we had. Um, so people are coming in. People are doing it. And it brings, again, brings community together. It's a great volunteer project. Uh, there's a great YouTube video. If, you, um, if you're ever interested, there's a great YouTube video on how to, how to make these. This one up here, we, every year we have an event now um, called Design for Felines. It started out as Architects for Animals, and then we moved to Designs for Felines. Um, all the, not all, um, a handful of architecture firms in DC um, some of the schools that do design, we have a contest, a shelter, cat shelter building uh, contest. It's a big event. Um, we have it. It's, you know, we have all the shindig, the wine and the cheese and all the little things. It's at a big, uh, bigger, uh, you know, um, a big place and all of the, all of the entries are lined up and um, we award winners. This was the winner two years ago. Um, and it's, I like it because it catches rainwater. You can see the little trough or dish right there. It captures all the rainwater and fills the water dish. Um, but it's a huge event now. It sells out every year. And that money goes to our Community Cats program. And we have all of the other shelters. That was another one. Um, all of the other shelters that are made, um, we get to take and bring them to the community. Um, so it's really cool. It's a really cool event. So one of the things that we are now looking at um, is the effectiveness of our program and where to go next and what to, what to focus on next. So you'll see here, um, this area of DC here is considered southeast and southwest DC. It's east of the river. Um, and this is where we have been targeting uh, all of our most aggressive efforts recent, uh, for the past three years, actually, with a grant from PetSmart. And so this year, now this is all of 2015, and this is the heat map. And if you looked at 2012 and 13, you would have seen the hot yellow dots all focused around here. And now this, this is also, oh, I'm sorry, this is all stray cat intake for the organization. So this is where we were, we have been focusing, and now we know where we need to focus more efforts. Uh, does anyone use mapping programs? I asked in my last workshop, I think. My God, I love mapping. I'm just like, a, I am not a like nerd by any stretch of the imagination when it comes to anything but maps. I love maps. And it just shows us what to do, where to go, and where our problems are. Um, for instance, the yellow dot up here, this heat map up, this heat spot up here, um, that is a heat spot. That's a hot spot for wildlife complaints. That's a hot spot for dogs running at large. It's a hot spot for uh, animal cruelty investigations as well. So what does that tell you? That neighborhood that is right there, we're going to be spending a lot of time throughout 2017. We're going to be spending a lot of time in there, um, making sure that we address all the problems we can. So yeah, that's um, pretty much where, where, what we look at and for, for evaluating where we need to go and what we need to do. So then we, obviously, I love this, so we release, and the question is always, does this program really work? Does TNR really work? We started our TNR program as a pilot program in 2007, and here is our stray cat euthanasia rate. Um, in 2007, 85% of the stray cats that came into our building was euthanized. Um, we dropped down. In 2012, um, animal control became very aggressive in their efforts for, uh, along with us. 
Um, we got, we got um, a couple of more officers, the overnight officers. We did some scheduling, and um, we were able to uh, have them play a more active role, and you could see it plummet even more. And now, um, in 2015, we ended with a 12% euthanasia rate. It's all sick or injured. We do, uh, if someone calls and we, we place a cat back into the community that we aren't sure whether or not came from the community, was a lost pet, it was one of those ones that came in, held for five days, and then wasn't really adoptable, was, wasn't thriving in the shelter, and we decided to TNR them. Um, we have those people watch and keep an eye to make sure that the cat is thriving. And in, la in 2015, we only had to go back out and get five. <coughs> but it works. And this 12% is a, um, is a huge, huge drop. And we're really proud of that. And that again, that is all sick or injured. So TNR does work. And that's, that's that. That's that. Um, Thanks.